Good morning, everybody. Joining us live from Etober News, Livestream Travel, Hawaii News Online, or wherever else you're joining us. If you wanted to be part of our live audience, we haven't started yet. You can still do this. Just go to worldtourismevents.com, worldtourismevents.com, and um, you see our um, breaking news East show. Um, no, West show. I'm sorry. <laughs> East or West is difficult. Uh, West show was our next one, and you can just simply uh, click on it and join and register. There's no charge. Otherwise, uh, feel free to just stay on and stay tuned. And we're going to be starting in about five minutes, four or five minutes. Okay. All right. So, Peter, I didn't want to shut you up. No, no, it's okay. At least that I've become friends. We'll chat. <laughs> yes. Where in Florida are you, Lisa? I am in Ormond Beach. I'm just south of St. Augustine and just north of Daytona. I'm right in between. So yeah. our corporate office is there. And then our lab is in Winter Garden, which is just outside of Orlando. Yeah, I, I, I know Florida pretty well. I mean, not every part of it. My, my parents used to have a, a winter home in uh, Sarasota, which is yep. I know, area is just beautiful. And it is. I, coming from New Jersey, New York, half my family is in Florida. I'm also from New Jersey. Oh, so, where? Yeah, I'm from Tom's River. Okay, down south. I'm from Verona, which is Essex County. Yep. By the border with Morris County. Yep, yep. I So I lived in Ocean County. That's where Tom's okay. River is. They're right on the shore. Very nice. Tom's River. I remember when Tom's River had 3,000 people and it was a little village. Yep. My parents first moved there when it was that small. Yes, and it's not yep. that way anymore. No, no, it is not. My, my dad, you know, grew up in Philadelphia. So yeah. moving to Tom's River, he was just blown away by how small it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. grown well, quite a bit. New Jersey are really great, though. I, I'm still a loyal New Jerseyan. Yes. Oh, yeah, me too. Absolutely. I'm excited. I think I'm going to be going up to New York in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm really excited to get back up home. Yes, yes, I yeah. understand. Yeah. How long have you been in Texas? Uh, I came in 1982, so okay. 92, 22, almost 40 years. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's been a long time since I've been here. I kept my New Jersey accent, uh, <laughs> but I guess the rest of it is it's Texanized. Um, yeah. But yeah, I lived in Colorado for about six and a half years in my 20s. Um, my Jersey accent is, it's diminished greatly until I get upset about something and then my Jersey accent yeah, comes I'm out the same. strongly. <laughs> People that always ask me where I'm from and then the two times it comes back is if I'm upset or if I'm in New Jersey yes. and then all of a sudden people say, oh, how long are you going to visit Texas for? And I go, well, I actually live there and they go, but you sound like you're from here. I go, well, I am from here. <laughs> <laughs> and it all just comes flooding back the second you're around yes, all of your yes. old friends. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I get the same thing. My husband doesn't recognize me when I go back home because my, my accent comes out so much more thickly than it is all, all the other yeah, times. I tell people the only place in the world I don't have an accent is Newark Airport. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. And That's I still, and I'm like Leif Erickson, you know, when he told, every, he changed the name of Iceland was a good country and he made it Iceland. And Greenland was a terrible country, so I made a Greenland so people wouldn't come to the good country. So I tell New Yorkers, you'll hate Newark Airport. LaGuardia is so much better. Go to LaGuardia. All right. Well, while we're discussing New Jersey and Colorado, just uh, for everyone who's joining us on Etobo News live right now, I see there are quite a few of you. Just feel free to join our live audience. You can still do this in going to worldtourismevents.com. WorldTourismEvents.com, or if you are on Etobo yeah, News, uh, uh, just click on. I'm so I sorry. <laughs> just uh, just click on the uh, event page, and you can still sign up and be part of the live audience. Thank you. I'm sorry. I had to stop Alexa in the background trying to wake me up here. So let's <laughs> get some people in the audience. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so we get some people joining us here. Good morning. We're just about to start in about four or five minutes. Uh, no, I'm sorry, in two minutes, one minute. 
in five seconds. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we're just about ready. Everyone on social media and eTurbo News, one last call. If you wanted to join our live audience, you can do this. Just click on events on the bar above you or go to worldtourismevents.com. You can still sign up and ask questions. Otherwise, uh, we're just about to start. You can just stay tuned where you are. And if you miss any of this, we'll repeat it a number of times and it'll be on our archive as well. Okay, I think we're ready. Good morning, Aloha from Hawaii. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz, joining you from Itobo News World Tourism Network in Honolulu. With me, as always, is uh, Dr. Peter Tarlow in College Station, Texas. And we changed our format, so we're now actually live, and we have a guest, um, Lisa Wilson. We will introduce Lisa in just a minute. And before we do this, as we always do, we're going to start with the weather. I can tell you it's early morning here, and it's beautiful, blue sky. Um, I can. It's going to be a nice beach day here in Hawaii. How's everything in Texas, Peter? Well, we're having typical Texas summer weather. Um, so right now it's mid afternoon and it's warm. It's not too bad. It's between 95 and 100, which is pretty typical for Texas. So we are expecting the possibility of an afternoon shower. So, um, but you know, this is life in the tropics. So you got to kind of expect that. Yes, and there's a lot going on in this world. And uh, Peter, maybe if you want to you're ahead of me with the time a little bit. Uh, summarize what are the most important items before we go to Lisa? Well, of course, um, Lisa is going to be speaking with us uh, very soon. But the number one topic, of course, is the um, number of Americans uh, from the US perspective who are caught in um, Afghanistan. They just had a news conference with the um, Department of uh, Defense and that was kind of a semi-disaster when they admitted they don't know how many Americans are there. And that's created somewhat of a problem. Uh, the French are going house to house to try to find French citizens, but um, the US does not yet seem to have a plan for evacuation. So that of course is an issue. And the other issue which we'll be talking about, which is more COVID related, is should masks be required for children in schools or not? Or is there another methodology? And a lot of parents are saying to school boards, you would not want to go eight hours without a mask. You cannot ask a five-year-old or a six-year-old to wear a mask. So that's becoming quite a, a hot topic issue. And in the United States, those are probably the two big issues of the day. Um, so we'll see you know, where those go. Hopefully we're gonna come up with some sort of methodology to get people out of Afghanistan. Um, as you know, it's been quite a chaotic situation with mothers literally throwing children over fences to try to get their kids out. And um, that's, it's, it's very heartbreaking what's going on. Um, many women now are being uh, attacked, um, beaten and raped, and at least there are reports. We don't know if it's true or not, but there are reports that the Taliban are going from house to house, um, looking for women between the ages of 15 and 40 and telling them that they will become sex slaves um, or given over to Afghan fighters as uh, 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 Taliban fighters as, um, as uh, war booty. Um, let's hope those reports are incorrect, uh, but it'll only be time will tell. So I think from that very quick, uh, tragic kind of summary, we want to really jump into the whole issue that Lisa's going to be speaking about. And, um, Lisa, maybe, uh, unless you and you wanted to give a formal presentation, maybe we can let Lisa just present herself and tell us the topic of the day. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, we're going to talk about testing, and testing is such an important issue. We're all talking about the vaccine. We're talking about booster shots, how we protect ourselves. And we have participants and viewers from all over the world, so it's a, it's a global 
issue, obviously, and um, finding out how you can best actually prepare yourself. Do you, should you get the shot? Should you get a booster shot? And and I think um, Lisa's company came with some additional information that might be useful for someone to make this decision and actually help um, to go through the testing process and see what tests make sense and others may not make so much sense. But Lisa, you can probably explain this quite a bit better than I can and uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for Before having me. Begin, I just gonna have one request that I know that lots of people are asking. And that is, if you could talk about the interrelation between your testing process and children. And would this be a way to deal with say the mask issue in the schools? So yeah. if, during your chat, if you could bring that up, I know there are a lot of people very interested in it. They've indicated to me they'd like to hear you speak about that, if, if possible. Of Thank of you. Course. And I should say that Lisa and I are both fellow New Jerseyans. So by definition, she's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, this is such a, a timely topic. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak on it. Um, my name is Lisa Wilson. I am the CEO and co-founder of Epitome Risk Solutions. We handle dynamic risk as well as COVID compliance for TV and film, professional sports, and live events. We have also started our own clinical lab called Fourth Wall Testing, where we have done point of care COVID testing for TV and film. And we have had the extreme privilege of partnering with an immunologist by the name of Dr. Marvin Hausman, who has introduced us to GenScript, which is a biotech corporation uh, that has designed a test that um, verifies your level of protection post-vaccination or post-previous infection. So this new test is, is groundbreaking and we have been able to develop it into an at-home test. That's just a quick finger prick that you're able to just take a small blood sample and send it back to our lab to have results within 24 to 48 hours. And, and but what, what is different between this type of test? There's a lot of tests, for instance, they're instant tests. You can get back within minutes. I, I remember when I went to Europe about a month or two ago, um, every restaurant you wanted to go to, if you're not vaccinated, um, you literally get a test literally in front of the restaurant and you get a result. Um, now, you it's I'm talking about 24, 48 hours, what is more like a PCR type test. So what this is, yeah, so this is not a PCR test. So PCR testing and some of those rapid tests that you receive in public are for active infection. They detect whether or not you have COVID in your system at that time. Those are very reactive tests. And the, the issue with those tests is you have to have a certain level of viral load in order to register as positive. So, so many people are passing through those tests that are contagious and actually do have COVID, but they're testing negative and being admitted into these events, uh, which can cause greater issues. Our test measures your level of protection post-vaccination. So what it does is it allows you that peace of mind in knowing that you can go out in public and feel better protected from contracting the virus, regardless of what's going on around you. So our test is more proactive um, and theirs is more reactive if you're doing a PCR live, um, live virus test. And, and you're, I was, uh, I'm sorry, Jurgen. Oh, go ahead. I was, uh, I was just um, in Israel, and one of the things that we had to do was take a serology test. And what yes. they measured was um, the amount of antibodies we had in our system and our yeah. ability to fight off um, COVID. How is yours like or different from a serology test? That's an excellent question. So ours is a serology test. It is a, just a more specific serology test than what they are offering um, outside of, of our test. So that test that you took when you're in Israel um, was probably more of a standard antibody test, like you said. So when you are exposed to the vaccine or a potential infection with COVID, your body creates all different kinds of antibodies to attack different parts of the virus. It's similar to throwing darts at a dartboard blindfolded. Your immune system just kind of hopes something works. So those antibody tests measure all of the different types of antibodies. Ours only measures what hits the bullseye 
on the dartboard, right? So the very specific antibodies that are neutralizing antibodies. And what that means is when you're looking at the virus, you see those little red spikes that come out. You know, we see those pictures everywhere now, right? I mean, I think we're all, we could probably see the COVID picture in our sleep. Those little red spikes that come out, um, the neutralizing antibodies attach to those, those little spikes and they block those spikes from attaching to your cells, which is what causes infection. So it blocks the infection from happening. So our test only measures how much neutralization you have from your antibodies. Um, so it's, it's de definitely something you should do parallel with any other test or is it something you, what would replace a regular test? So where it's important is, you know, if you are if you are vaccinated, it's not enough to just say, I'm vaccinated, I'm good. Um, what we have discovered in our lab from our research is 36% of our clients that reported being fully vaccinated have tested negative for neutralizing antibodies, which means that they would be at risk for contracting COVID, but they wouldn't have known that had they not taken the test, they would be going out and living their lives as though they were protected. So it's really important to know for yourself what your levels are um, to know how protected you are in the world. So I know in Austria, they have made it one of their regulations that to go into major sporting events, you need either a negative PCR test within 72 hours of the event or a positive neutralizing antibody test within six months leading up to the event. Um, we are finding that, you know, testing every like three to six months, depending on what your neutralization level is, um, is sufficient to, to forecast your protection level during that time. That, of course, is interesting. So you don't have to do tests twice a week or every week. I know if you wanted to get a job like here in Hawaii and work for the state and you're not vaccinated, you have to get a test twice a week. With your test, you only have to get it like... Once every three to six months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so yeah. How would that impact the tourism industry? Because one of the things we do is we talk about tourism all the time and for example, if I have to go from one country to another, three countries, yeah. I got to carry testing with me yeah. and I can keep getting on the plane. Would this be some way of showing an airport that, you know, I'm good to go for the next three or four months? Yes, that would be, we're, we're trying to move in that direction um, to have that be more widely recognized because it really isn't enough that that negative PCR test doesn't do what everyone's hoping it will do. Because like I said earlier, you can test negative on a PCR and that's just because your viral load wasn't high enough to register as positive, but you could still be contagious. Um, so it's it, the thing is everyone's missing the mark a little bit by doing vaccine passports and requiring vaccinations. I, I understand and appreciate the thought behind it. However, there is another step in that process. And that step is, did you have the appropriate immune response to not get sick? That's the part that we're missing in this whole process right now. And that's what this test provides. And of course, this is, this is quite interesting. I mean, from our organization, the World Tourism Network, uh, we had been discussing this issue with the World Health Organization, with governments around the world, in how to do it, what's the best way moving forward? Specifically, you mentioned vaccine passports. Airlines came out with their own passports. Countries come up with their own passports. Some countries recognize the passport of another country, some don't. So there's a lot of confusion. So even if there's a green light for travel, it doesn't mean you can easily travel and these rules can change um, overnight. Now with your test and you said this long-term result, what is what would be on your wish list uh, for world for the World Health Organizations and for governments to do, considering what you're doing is available? I would really love for them to adopt this as the test to to go from country to country because if you are just requiring the vaccine card, especially here in the U.S those cards, there's forgery rings being broken up all the time um, of people making these, these, these cards. What I would love to have happen is instead of the vaccine card, it be this test that is actually revealing the immune response because you know, 36% of our patients that are reporting being fully vaccinated are testing negative. 
that's, that's a large percentage to allow onto the state of Hawaii, right? Onto the islands, right? You're saying 36% of people potentially could have the neutralization levels that are non-existent, but they think that they're good and they're, they're going all around the, the, the island. They're traveling without any issues at all. Um, and so I think that that's the most important thing. I, I would love to see this be more widely recognized. Um, I feel like Europe is, has been a little bit quicker to adopt this test versus the U.S. right now. Now, when that's, that's tended to be behind in a lot of medical things. Yeah, let's go go for the example you mentioned, Hawaii. Um, and Hawaii is not different than any country or any other state, but we're an island, so we we have better ways of protecting ourselves being on an island. And uh, right now, flying to Hawaii, you need to have a negative. Uh, either you have to have a vaccine card that you have been vaccinated twice or you have to show a negative PCR test done within 72 hours. Now with your test, you're saying the test is good for six months, but what about if, if you um, generate this test and someone gets infected three months later, wouldn't you put this person and then also in this case, the state of Hawaii and everyone else in harm's way? Well, it comes down to the titer, right? So, you know, especially with the Delta variant being so much more easily transmissible, we would want to see a higher titer on those individuals uh, post vaccine that would account for some of the variants that are out there right now. Um, but having this neutralizing antibody test actually puts you at less of a risk of what you're, you're saying than the PCR testing um, that's happening right now. Um, one of the things that people have been asking is uh, how available is this test in the US? And um, how expensive is it? Is it a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, five hundred dollars? Yeah, no, it's not five hundred dollars. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so there are there are many labs that are offering neutralizing antibody testing uh, through GenScript. GenScript does have the patent on this on this particular science called CPAS. Um, we are a lab that has taken that, that test and made it into that at-home finger prick test that you can just ship back to our lab, um, including shipping. Right now, the cost is $170 uh, per test. Um, of course, for organizations and, and for, for mass orders that are using it for all of their employees, because this is an excellent solution for, for organizations to get their workforce back, um, there is some, some flexibility on that, of course, for the larger orders. But for you know the one-offs, it would be 170 um, to go at your at home. And I see, I, I see some question is that would only be 170 every six months. Yeah. Really right, versus, versus what you're paying really for PCR testing. 340 per year. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I just uh, wanted to remind everybody, there have been some questions here on chat and you can do this, um, but uh, we also would love to give you the microphone and the camera. Just raise your hand. There is a button on the uh, on your screen on the bottom part that says raise hands. Then we know you wanted to speak. And we would be happy to let you talk and ask your questions. Or if you feel more comfortable typing it in the chat, what uh, Sarah has been doing and Peter has been responding to, that's great. But it's always also nice to see a face and hear a voice behind this. Now, uh, since we have a very international audience and um, your your uh, test is done, I believe, in Florida. Um, are similar tests available in other parts of the world? Or if they wanted to get this test, do they have to ship it to Florida? But then, of course, would take way more time and maybe customs restrictions to make this go. Are you guys expanding to other countries? Yeah, the plan is to expand. Um, we are not there uh, right now, um, but the plan is to expand. I know if you go to GenScript's website, if you are in other countries at genscript.com, they do have a list of their partners in other countries. Um, so I would, I would um, urge you to go that direction if you are looking for them over in Europe or in other places in, in Asia, um, Australia, places like that. Now, your um, test, if someone gets your test, um, where would you? How would you keep this test? Is there an app um, you can? Is it? It will it go into a vaccine passport, or um, how do you keep record of it? Or how would a, 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 a traveler, for example, keep a record of it? So we actually we are now sending them out via encrypted email, your lab report. Um, however, uh, we are launching at the beginning of September our brand new app called All Health Portal. Um, which we'll be launching beta September 1st. And 
from there, you would be able to get your results immediately right on your phone and be able to keep all of your lab results there. So that way you can have your results chronologically. Um, it also is available for employers who are looking to um, track the results of their employees via you know, HIPAA waivers that are signed by the employees here in the US. And that way they can track the results to get people back to work safely. So we have a dashboard for employers to be able to track those things. And then we have dashboards for individuals so they can see the chronology of their results. And, and of course, it, it all um, really takes for people to change for a mind, mindset change, not only for, for uh, people, but also for governments and those that make a decision. Paulo, uh, for instance, uh, Pires, uh, he he uh, he has a, a comment here in chat that he recently he must be in Africa trying to travel to the kingdom of Eswatini. And Eswatini, by the way, is very close to us because it's the home of the African Tourism Board, what um, is a strategic partner for the World Tourism uh, Network. And uh, he said he had to go through South Africa to get to Eswatini because when he tried to cross the border, and I don't know what country he is in. But uh, in Mozambique, South Africa, um, they did not accept the rapid test and they wanted a PCR test. And um, so there is still a lot of confusion. I be believe this confusion is not only on the Eswatini South African border, it's everywhere else. Now, are you guys sitting on the table with the World Health Organization or with governments, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, and have these discussions? We are having many conversations right now uh, at the state level and also working at the federal level um, to get this pushed through to have some some more um, importance in, in what we're doing. Uh, we are speaking to you know state legislature about their nursing home population specifically because they are a very at risk population um, that you know we need to be able to track what their neutralization levels are because you know staff are in and out all of the time uh, and you just don't know if they're their carriers you know asymptomatic carriers bringing them into the nursing home so um, they were also the the elderly population was also the very first cohort to be vaccinated so we are seeing a very high uptick in cases because many of them are those individuals whose neutralization levels have waned over time. So now we're kind of in this perfect storm situation of the Delta variant coming out, a very large percentage of people here in the US at least that are unvaccinated, and then people that were vaccinated, that first cohort, their levels are, are deteriorating. And I think this could be a, a good idea. you mentioned earlier um, that you're ready to join us at the World Tourism Network, maybe to start an interest group about vaccine, what is so important. We don't have this yet. Um, and if we had such an interest group, you could lead it. Um, and, and I think this would allow you to get this message out also to those uh, that can help to make a decision how to recognize your um, your type of uh, test. I'm talking yeah. about World health organization, other tourism organizations, ministries of tourism, um, tourism boards, and people like this. That would be yeah, excellent. Confusion, I think, still on the part of the public over testing, over vaccinations, over masks, over, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, every day we think it, somebody else is telling us something slightly different. And what the data is yesterday is not the data tomorrow. So I mm -hmm. think if somebody were leading, really updating that type of information, it'd be very valuable for lots of people, especially in the tourism and travel industry. Well, people are always moving from one place to the other. Yes. You know, it's what we need to do globally is have a shift on the way that we look at vaccines and boosters in particular. So we have all been conditioned to look at the date on a calendar to say when we need a booster. Uh, the CDC and the FDA just came out today, today and said that it will be eight months. So eight months after your second dose is when you would be eligible for a booster but everyone is very, very different. Some people won't need that booster at eight months. Their immune system may have had a response that they won't need it at that time. They could probably wait. Others, um, like a very close family member of mine, don't have that luxury of waiting to eight months. They're already negative after five months post-vaccination. So it really just comes down to what is your body telling you that you need? And you need to be able to do what you specifically need from your immune system's perspective. Yeah, at least I think your point's really important 
that we're using a one size fit all methodology. And lots of countries are doing that. And then different countries are diff using different systems. The, the Israeli Medical Association recommends a booster after six months. Yep. Uh, the CDC said eight months mm -hmm. and nobody really knows. No. no. Um, you know, and like I said, our, our research is showing that there are some major variants, you know, other people had no response at all to the vaccine, you know, and, and that's a, that's a smaller percentage. You're talking maybe 4% of people that had no response from the initial vaccine. Um, but when you get up to 36% after just a few months, that's, that's something to, to sound the alarm about. And really what you're saying is quite fascinating because it adds an entire new layer of um, uh, the, the subject of uh, vaccine testing and, and everything else. And um, so I think it's it's quite quite um, an important addition to the overall discussion in the world when it comes to how to protect yourself. And um, yeah, so I, I wanted to uh, really thank you for being a guest on, on our show today. And I think uh, we can all learn from you and hopefully you can uh, keep us updated. Now, uh, we're, we're coming uh, close to an end of our segment, but I wanted to give everyone the chance again to ask more questions if uh, if there are any questions. So you can either type it in the chat box or you can um, easily raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you uh, if um, you prefer. I, I also do want to mention if you need more information about our test, you can go to epitomerisk.com. Um, and look at our COVID immune assessment page, and you Maybe can get more information. Spell it and say it real slowly. Of course. Maybe do it easier, uh, Peter. If you can just uh, send me this later by chat, I put it on our archive, and people can then see it uh, all the time. You know, it might make it easier than trying to spell it <laughs> on, on our show. But it is important, and specifically if you join the World Tourism Network. You have your own page with all your links and all your information. That's probably the easiest way to get okay. messages. Lisa, can people um, also uh, email you or contact you individually, or would you rather have it just done via the web page? Sure, they can. Um, they can go through the web page, or they can email at adventure at epitomerisk.com. Okay, and then people could ask you a very maybe personal or specific question yes. rather than a question that they don't want the whole world to know. Absolutely. I, I do want to point out we are not a, a medical doctor to give very specific medical advice. I would still urge you to contact your, your PCP, your provider, uh, for very specific health information about you. But we are absolutely here to discuss our findings and also what our tests can do. I think, you know, one of the things that you're pointing out, but I, you didn't really say it, but I'm going to say it for you. Sure. And that is that many of the physicians are also a little bit um, in the dark about yeah. many things. And it really maybe would be excellent if this, um, the tape of this show could be sent to the American Medical Association or be distributed to doctors around the country mm -hmm. because, or the world, because again, everything dealing with COVID is basically new. I mean, nobody studied this in medical school. Right. And so they, the more information we can get to medical professionals mm -hmm. or if they have places to go, it's, they're able to learn. It's kind of like a pharmaceutical rep who often teach the doctors, not the other way around because they're specialists in that one particular area. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, we, we've actually received many test requests from doctors, chief medical officers from, from different organizations. And, you know, we are fortunate to have Dr. Marvin Hausman on our team. So he's been able to, to speak to them, you know, about what this test is and, you know, from a, a medical, uh, an MD perspective, MD to MD, about what this test means and, and, and how to use it moving forward. Well, that's uh, definitely, Ned. Uh, Paulo, um, our friend from Mozambique, has um, a, a comment, and I I'm, I'm, don't know, uh, what you think about it, but it's, uh, he said, basically, we'll be t uh, talking about vaccine and booster shots every six months till we have a cure for COVID. Um, do you agree with this? I, our, our study is finding that, yes, we will need booster shots 
um, pretty frequently. Um, and but everyone will be different. You know, for me personally, my my uh, neutralization level is about ninety five percent right now, and I was vaccinated in in March. So I feel very very good about being out in the world, and I feel as though I have quite. A bit of time before I would need a booster. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens after this first round of boosters go out. Um, I know Pfizer is touting that your titer will go up 10 times higher than it was from the second dose. So it will be interesting to continue the studies in that arena to see where it goes from there. Now, I'm wondering about is some states like New York or New York City now require um, basically a vaccine passport. Yeah. So if you're going into a restaurant or into um, anything, a any closed space, you have to have proof of vaccination. On some level, what you're pointing out is that we both could have been vaccinated on the same day, but we may have very different results. Very so different. basically, on some level, what you're indicating is those vaccine passports are kind of silly, or they are superficial at best. And then we're going to need to have some sort of other indication to level to indicate more by the individual rather than one size fits all. And I don't know if you have any comments about the vaccine passports, um, but I think you're making a really strong point that you know we have to think about: Do we really want these? Are these smart? Are these stupid? Or are these kind of productive? I believe that they are. I definitely wouldn't say that they're silly. I think that they're a step in in the right direction. And I think that they're, I think the, the thought process is, I understand the thought process. I do believe that it's not infallible though. I think that they're just missing a step in that process because of the very large spectrum of immune responses um, after taking the vaccine. So I think that while I understand the sentiment, of protecting people, um, I think that we have missed a very, I think we have a very big blind spot right now that we're not pointing out publicly. Yeah, so this is something really goes beyond medicine to public policy and public health. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. It's changing because this is an, an issue, what is, uh, there, there is no uh, silver lining. We don't really know where things are going. And, um, and it, it takes uh, people like Lisa and her company to make a difference and, and change the way we think about it. So I think this is an important discussion. We should continue. And I wanted to thank you, Lisa, uh, again, for being part of our audience today. And uh, those that are watching us now, and if you wanted to watch it again, we'll be repeating it. It'll start in about two, three hours and it's going to be repeated for the next uh, 24 hours on your screen. Or if you miss it and you want to watch it later, you can either go to livestream.travel or go to our YouTube channel, um, or and uh, you will be able to um, watch it anytime. But I'm sure this is not the last thing we heard from Lisa, um, because this is really a fascinating uh, subject to discuss. And I encourage everyone, uh, because we have a lot of viewers, um, not only live, but also not live from around the world um, to send in your ideas or send in your questions or feedback on this. And um, uh, so we can maybe help to expand this discussions also to the powers to be um, to make changes in whatever region in the world at uh, whatever institution or in the world to bring Lisa's um, ideas and um, test into the picture. Um, other than that, um, thank you again, Lisa. Thank you, Peter, for being part thank of you. our- Thank you everybody for listening because this is actually these types of tests and help us all to be safer. So it's not just about the person, it's not just about the me, it's about the we. Yes. Yeah. And before I say aloha, I give Lisa the last word and we will show Lisa's contact information. And once you join WTN, you will have your own page with all the information, but we're also going to put it on the screen uh, so everyone knows how to get in touch with Lisa. But Lisa, you got the last word. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you again for having me. It was it was a pleasure. I do want to, to leave everyone with the imparting message that it is more important now than ever to be your own health advocate. You need to know what your body is saying that it needs, and you can't listen to 
what others are saying you need. You need to take action for yourself and be your own advocate. Um, it's, it's all that you can do at this point. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Aloha from here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Say hello to New Jersey when you go. I will. I will. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Although the late 20th century and the 21st century have seen a decline in this geographic advantage due to mass tourism and the current U.S. administration's lack of desire to protect the U.S. southern border, the principle still holds true. Canada has had the advantage of having a long peaceful border with the U.S. which has permitted Canada to expend minimal resources on military defense. Afghanistan is a completely different situation. This landlocked nation is in the heart of what historians call the Silk Roads. To a great extent these are the lands in the heart of the world, and it is in these lands that much of the world's economic history has occurred. Afghanistan not only sits in the middle of the Silk Roads, but the nation is also incredibly rich in mineral resources. According to Peter Frankopan citing the U.S. Geological Survey reports that Afghanistan is rich in copper, iron, mercury, and potash. The nation also has major reserves on what is known as rare earths. These earth include lithium, beryllium, niobium, and copper. With the fall of Kabul these rare minerals and valuable substances are now in the Taliban's hands and these mineral have the potential to make the Taliban incredibly rich. We should not be surprised if the Taliban do not use this economic windfall as a way to further their stated objective of creating a worldwide Islamic caliphate. Few Westerners and even fewer tourism officials understand the value of these rare earths and minerals and the fact that China also possesses large quantities of many of these substances. We use these substances in everything from computer production to talcum powder. This control over rare and necessary minerals and rare earths means that a Taliban-Chinese alliance becomes a new challenge for Western nations and by extension their tourism industries. Kabul's fall also has a political crisis. Its conquest greatly increases not only the Taliban's prestige but that of numerous other terrorism and insurgency groups around the world. From this perspective the conquest of Kabul, and by extension Afghanistan, is a symbol for anyone who opposes European and American influence and power of what they perceive as the West's long road to self-destruction. This symbolism is especially powerful as the Taliban captured Kabul just a few weeks prior to the 20th anniversary of September 11, 2001. The fact the Taliban flag now flies over the former U.S. Embassy speaks volumes to people throughout the developing world. The symbolism throughout much of the Middle East and the nations of the Silk Roads could not be more poignant. Due to the United States and its allies abandoning the Bagram airfield some of 20 years after the attacks on New York and Washington, Westerners, and their Afghan allies are reduced to imploring the Taliban for safe passage to the only airport out of which they can fly to safety. Tourism has long been an industry in which many women have held prominent positions. Women in a Taliban-dominated Afghanistan are sure to lose even their most basic rights. Women's groups around the world not only worry about the safety and freedom of Afghan women but also have noted the silence of the first U.S. female president. As of August 19, Vice President Harris has not made a public pronouncement regarding the state of insecurity in which millions of women now find themselves. From the perspective of the United States and Europe the fall of Kabul could not have come at a worse time. Western national economies are reeling from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The United States, and much of Europe, is suffering from inflation caused by overspending. This overspending first occurred during the Obama administration, then continued during the Trump administration and has now greatly increased during the current Biden administration. The fact that the United States is spending trillions of dollars of money that it does not have means that the nation is less able to deal with international crises and potential military threats. Additionally, the woke cancel culture, seen in much of the world as mere political rot or social decay, means that the West's focus is on inconsequential internal matters rather than on economic and political threats. Perhaps nothing speaks to this internal weakness and its impact on tourism more than the U.S.-Mexico border crisis. This crisis should not be seen as separate from the fall of Kabul. As perhaps almost 2 million illegal immigrants cross the U.S.-Mexico border, the nation's border patrol is overwhelmed and understaffed. Not only do refuges cross this border but many of them are ill with COVID and none are vetted. How many coming into the U.S., and now once again Europe, may be stealth terrorists is unknown. As crime increases tourism will once again suffer. Border control agents may also feel the impact of COVID-29. Many of whose agents are now sick with COVID. What we do not as yet know is how many unvetted migrants may also be part of terrorist sleeper cells that can be turned against nations in Europe and the United States and creating another 9-11 tourism crisis. 
Possible Implications of the Taliban's Takeover of Afghanistan. It is of course too soon to realize the full extent of the consequences of the Taliban victory not only on world politics but also on tourism. We should remember that tourism is a byproduct of world's political situation. Although tourism promotes peace, it also needs peace in order to thrive or merely survive. Wars, human rights violations, illnesses, and natural disasters all dissuade visitors from coming to a specific location. Below are some of the things that the tourism industry might expect from the poorly executed U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Although few would argue that after a 20-year war and the loss of trillions of dollars and thousands of lives it was time to leave, the U.S. withdrawal's poor execution will be seen as American weakness and ineptitude around the world. Major politicians from U.S. allies such as the United Kingdom and Germany have called this NATO's greatest military defeat and wonder about the U.S. resolve to be a world leader. Both China and Russia will applaud the Taliban's victory and will see the Western nation's defeat as a way to control the region's natural resources. The overspending on the part of the current U.S. administration means greater dependency on China and the U.S. government's inability to stand up to the Chinese. This in turn will lead to an eventual lowering of Western standards of living and a pulling back of expendable income expenses such as tourism. The control of major resources by the Taliban can easily translate into acts of well-funded terrorism around the world and especially against the tourism industry we should expect to see new outbreaks of violence around the world. China might well attack Taiwan and seek dominance over the entire eastern Pacific region. Tourism in this region can become totally dominated by the Chinese and countries such as North Korea might become emboldened to act in a reckless manner. Latin American nations such as Venezuela might see the Taliban victory and potential largesse as reasons to export revolution to other Latin American nations, thus causing a decline in tourism the West's ability to deal with Iran will be weakened and we should not be surprised to see the Taliban terrorist state collaborate with Iranian hardliners, especially in the face of weak U.S. administration Europe should expect an increase in unvetted refugees who will continue to make Europe less safe and less attractive to visitors. The result will be a decline in European living standards and quality of life. Due to an unprotected southern border, the U.S. might well suffer from higher rates of commutative diseases, and a post-Taliban national malaise. Even if there is not a repeat of terrorism due to the open border policies now in place, tourism might well suffer from the U.S. population's continual loss of faith in government. Were there to be additional major terrorism attacks, these attacks coupled with the fact that the tourism industry has not yet recovered from the COVID pandemic could easily result in multiple tourism industry bankruptcies and necessitating more needs for increased government bailouts and a further decline of the overall tourism industry. There can be no doubt that the fall of Kabul might become a metaphor for the fall of the tourism industry. On the other hand it can also be a wake-up call and a way in which the West comes together, works together and creates the conditions for an expanded tourism industry and greater safety and security. Let's hope that we have learned the lessons of the last few days and seek new ways to renew our strength and moral fortitude. In reality we in the tourism industry have no alternative. Join WTN click here. World Tourism Network, WTN, is the long overdue voice of small and medium-sized travel and tourism businesses around the world. By uniting our efforts, we bring to the forefront the needs and aspirations of small and medium-sized businesses and their stakeholders. World Tourism Network emerged out of the Rebuilding.Travel discussion. The Rebuilding.Travel discussion started on March 5, 2020 on the sideline of ITB Berlin. ITB was cancelled, but Rebuilding.Travel launched at the Grand Hyatt Hotel in Berlin. In December Rebuilding.Travel continued but was structured within a new organization called World Tourism Network, WTN. By bringing together private and public sector members on regional and global platforms, WTN not only advocates for its members but provides them a voice at the major tourism meetings. WTN provides opportunities and essential networking for its members in 128 countries. More information including membership in World Tourism Network visit www.wtn.travel. <music> 18-year-old to serve as new Port Canaveral Ambassador. 
At an August meeting of the Canaveral Port Authority Board of Commissioners, Port Commissioner Robin Hathaway announced the appointment of Rockledge High School graduate Jessica Maxwell as Port Canaveral Ambassador to serve as Commissioner Hathaway's delegate in the Port community. Jessica is Commissioner Hathaway's first Port Ambassador appointment, and at age 18, is the youngest person to serve as a delegate for the CPA Board of Commissioners. Each Canaveral Port Authority Commissioner may appoint up to two individuals to serve as a Commissioner's representative in the Port community. Port Ambassadors engage the community to promote greater understanding of Port Canaveral's role in the region. They also increase public awareness and understanding of the Canaveral Port Authority's strategic plans. As stewards of the port, we need to be looking to our future workforce and prepare the next generation to lead, said Commissioner Hathaway. Jessica is excited to learn and share our vision with her generation. I hope you will join me in welcoming her to her new role as Port Ambassador. As Port Ambassador, Jessica will assist Commissioner Hathaway with the Port's Junior Port Ambassador Program to share her knowledge from the HELM program, aiming to build relationships and increase public awareness and support for the Port's key activities among young people in the community. As a student at Rockledge High School, Jessica participated in the school's Helping Educate Leaders in Maritime HELM program. She also served as Battalion Commander for the Rockledge High School ROTC. An active equestrian, Jessica's post-graduation plan to enlist in the U.S. Navy was derailed after a horse-riding accident revealed she suffered from osteosarcoma, a bone cancer that resulted in the loss of one arm before the year was out. Port Canaveral, located in Florida, is a gateway for cruises and recreation as well as cargo and logistics. It has been long distinguished as the gateway to new frontiers in space travel. Port Canaveral hosts nearly 5 million revenue cruise passengers through its state-of-the-art terminals and 6 million tons of cargo annually. Tourism and Recreation at Port Canaveral At Port Canaveral, visitors can experience the thrill of a rocket launch while sunning on the beach. The Cove is a waterfront recreation area at Port Canaveral with restaurants, lounges, shops, charter boats, and a casino ship. Many Cove restaurants have outdoor tables and tiki bars, great locations for watching the cruise ships glide by or just enjoying an onshore breeze. When the sun goes down, there are DJs, live bands, dancing, and karaoke, oh and camping. IATA Travel Pass recognizes EU and UK digital COVID certificates. EU Digital COVID Certificate, DCC, and UK NHS COVID Pass can now be uploaded into IATA Travel Pass as verified proof of vaccination for travel. IATA OAKS EU Digital COVID Certificate, DCC, and UK NHS COVID Pass. Handling the European and UK certificates through IATA Travel Pass is an important step forward. Harmonization of digital vaccine standards is essential to support a safe and scalable restart of aviation. The International Air Transport Association IATA, has announced that the EU Digital COVID Certificate DCC, and UK NHS COVID Pass can now be uploaded into IATA Travel Pass as verified proof of vaccination for travel. IATA Travel Pass recognizes EU and UK digital COVID certificates. Travelers holding an EU DCC or UK NHS COVID pass can now access accurate COVID-19 travel information for their journey, create an electronic version of their passport and import their vaccination certificate in one place. This information can be shared with airlines and border control authorities who can have the assurance that the certificate presented to them is genuine and belongs to the person presenting it. COVID-19 vaccination certificates are becoming a widespread requirement for international travel. Handling the European and UK certificates through IATA Travel Pass is an important step forward, providing convenience for travelers, authenticity for governments and efficiency for airlines, said Nick Kareen, IATA's Senior Vice President for Operations Safety and Security. Harmonization of Digital Vaccine Standards Harmonization of digital vaccine standards is essential to support a safe and scalable restart of aviation, avoid unnecessary airport queues and ensure a smooth passenger experience. IATA welcomes the work done by the EU Commission in developing, in record time, the EU DCC system and thereby standardizing digital vaccine certificates across Europe. 
Building on the EUDCC success, IATA urges the World Health Organization, WHO, to revisit its work to develop a global digital vaccine standard. The absence of a global standard makes it much harder for airlines, border authorities and governments to recognize and verify a traveler's digital vaccination certificate. The industry is working around this by developing solutions that can recognize and verify certificates from individual countries. But this is a slow process that is hampering the restart of international travel. As more states roll out their vaccination programs, many are urgently looking to implement technical solutions to provide vaccine certification for their citizens when they travel. In the absence of a WHO standard, IATA urges them to look closely at the EUDCC as a proven solution that meets WHO guidance and can help to reconnect the world, said Karim. Turkmenistan opens its airspace for Afghanistan evacuation flights. In this situation, fulfilling its international commitments, including those arising from international humanitarian law, Turkmenistan will provide its airspace for the carriage of these persons by the planes of foreign states. On August 15, Taliban entered Kabul and established full control over city. Western countries are evacuating their nationals from Afghanistan. Turkmenistan allows Afghanistan evacuation flights to pass through its airspace. The press office of the Foreign Ministry of Turkmenistan issued a statement today announcing that Turkmenistan's government has made a decision to open the country's airspace to evacuation flights flying foreign nationals out of Afghanistan. Turkmenistan opens its airspace for Afghanistan evacuation flights. As is known, some countries have started to evacuate their citizens located in Afghanistan. In this situation, fulfilling its international commitments, including those arising from international humanitarian law, Turkmenistan will provide its airspace for the carriage of these persons by the planes of foreign states, the foreign ministry's statement said. On August 15, the Taliban radical militant group entered Kabul without any resistance and established full control over the Afghan capital within several hours. President of Afghanistan Ashraf Ghani has fled the country, allegedly taking $169 million of state treasury money with him. Since then, Afghanistan's Vice President Amrullah Saleh declared himself as the country's caretaker president, calling for armed resistance to the Taliban. Western countries are evacuating their nationals and embassy staff. Washington, D.C. Capitol Hill evacuated after active bomb threat. A man in a black pickup truck drove right up to the Library of Congress building and claimed to have an explosive device in the vehicle, before displaying what appeared to be a detonator. Security alert was raised today on Capitol Hill. Police evacuated the area around the Library of Congress. Police were responding to a suspicious vehicle near the Library of Congress. On Thursday, a security alert was raised on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. as staff were told to evacuate buildings and reports emerged that police were investigating a possible explosive device in a pickup truck. U.S. Capitol Police evacuated the area around the Library of Congress on Capitol Hill after a driver pulled up outside and claimed to have a bomb in his pickup truck, the police chief said. Washington, D.C. Capitol Hill evacuated after active bomb threat. In a tweet, U.S. Capitol Police said they were responding to a suspicious vehicle near the Library of Congress and urged people to stay away from the area. Police Chief Tom Manger told reporters close to the scene that at 9.15 a.m. local time a man in a black pickup truck drove right up to the Library of Congress building and claimed to have an explosive device in the vehicle, before displaying what appeared to be a detonator. Negotiations were conducted underway with the driver to find a peaceful resolution, Manger said. We don't know what his motives are at this time, the police chief added. Earlier, an unverified image taken outside the Library of Congress appeared to show the driver still in the vehicle, with dollar bills strewn on the ground outside the truck. The suspect also allegedly posted a now-deleted livestream filmed while sitting behind the driving seat inside the parked vehicle, in which he addressed U.S. President Joe Biden and claimed to have a number of bombs. Part of the footage appeared to show what looked to be a gas tank, plastic explosives and several large tubs of loose change in the truck. He said the alleged explosives in the truck were rigged to only be detonated by a loud enough noise, such as the windshield of the truck being shattered by gunshots. 
The man also alleged that there were four other explosive devices in undisclosed locations, claiming that others had transported them separately. Facebook subsequently locked the account of a user called Ray Roseberry after the 30-minute livestream. Footage shared online showed scores of law enforcement vehicles, including specialized emergency response team trucks, heading into the restricted area. In TV footage, police were seen cordoning off the area, with barriers raised to restrict access. According to the latest U.S. Capitol Police report, the suspect has finally surrendered to officers. Blocking airline funds threatens industry recovery. Approximately $963 million in airline funds are being blocked from repatriation in nearly 20 countries. Governments are preventing nearly $1 billion of airline revenues from being repatriated. Airlines will not be able to provide reliable connectivity if they cannot rely on local revenues. It is critical for all governments to prioritize ensuring that funds can be repatriated efficiently. The International Air Transport Association IATA, urged governments to abide by international agreements and treaty obligations to enable airlines to repatriate close to nearly $1 billion in blocked funds from the sale of tickets, cargo space, and other activities. Blocking airline funds threatens industry recovery. Governments are preventing nearly $1 billion of airline revenues from being repatriated. This contravenes international conventions and could slow the recovery of travel and tourism in affected markets as the airline industry struggles to recover from the COVID-19 crisis. Airlines will not be able to provide reliable connectivity if they cannot rely on local revenues to support operations. That is why it is critical for all governments to prioritize ensuring that funds can be repatriated efficiently. Now is not the time to score an own goal by putting vital air connectivity at risk, said Willie Walsh, IATA's Director General. Approximately $963 million in airline funds are being blocked from repatriation in nearly 20 countries. Four countries, Bangladesh, $146.1 million, Lebanon, $175.5 million, Nigeria, $143.8 million, and Zimbabwe, $142.7 million, account for over 60% of this total, although there has been positive progress in reducing blocked funds in Bangladesh and Zimbabwe of late. We encourage governments to work with industry to resolve the issues that are preventing airlines from repatriating funds. This will enable aviation to provide the connectivity needed to sustain jobs and energize economies as they recover from COVID-19, said Walsh. El Al relaunches Budapest to Tel Aviv flight. Reopening its connection between Budapest and Tel Aviv today, El Al will operate a four times weekly service on the 2,165 km sector. El Al returns to Budapest Airport. Israeli flag carrier resumes Tel Aviv services from Budapest. Budapest-Tel Aviv flights will operate four times weekly. Budapest Airport's route network resumption continues with the return of the Hungarian Gateways airline partner, El Al Airlines. El Al relaunches Budapest to Tel Aviv flight. Relaunching links to Tel Aviv, the Israeli flag carrier will once again significantly expand the airport's operations to the Middle Eastern country. Reopening its connection between Budapest and the city on the Mediterranean coast today, the carrier will operate a four times weekly service on the 2,165 km sector. Balaj Bogats, head of airline development, Budapest Airport said, We're so pleased to see El Al return. Budapest is one of the top destinations for Israeli travelers, so we know this service will be in high demand. Budapest has a large Jewish community and, indeed, the Great Synagogue of Budapest is the second largest synagogue in the world. We are, therefore, confident that El Al's resumption of services from Tel Aviv will be popular both with tourists and with travelers who are visiting friends and relatives. El Al Israel Airlines Limited is the flag carrier of Israel. Since its inaugural flight from Geneva to Tel Aviv in September 1948, the airline has grown to serve over 50 destinations, operating scheduled domestic and international services and cargo flights within Israel, and to Europe, the Middle East, the Americas, Africa, and the Far East, from its main base in Ben Gurion Airport.
Jamaica Tourism Minister names task force to boost vaccination of tourism workers. Jamaica Tourism Minister Hon. Edmund Bartlett has named a special task force to drive the process of vaccinating the island's tourism workers, as part of efforts by the government to achieve herd immunity. The task force will include representatives from the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, and Jamaica Defense Force, among others. Persons to be targeted are workers in hotels, villas, guest houses, attractions, airports, cruise ports, craft markets, and ground transportation operators. The minister was quick to note that tourism workers will not be mandated to be vaccinated. The new task force is co-chaired by the Tourism Ministry's Permanent Secretary, Jennifer Griffith and President of the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association, JHTA, Clifton Reader. The other members include Chairman of the Tourism Product Development Company, TPD Co., Ian Deer, Chairman of the Jamaica Tourist Board, John Lynch, Director of Tourism, Donovan White, President and CEO, the Port Authority of Jamaica, PAJ, Professor Gordon Shirley, Executive Director of Jamaica Vacations Limited, JAMBAC, Joy Roberts, Acting Executive Director, TPD Co., Stephen Edwards, Executive Director of Chukka Caribbean Adventures and Chairman of the COVID-19 Resilient Corridors Management Team, John Biles, Senior Advisor and Strategist in the Jamaica Ministry of Tourism, Delano Savewright, and General Manager of Deja Resorts, Robin Russell. The task force will also include representatives from the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development and the Jamaica Defense Force and they will consult with various tourism stakeholders, both within the public and private sectors, to streamline and expedite the process of vaccinating tourism workers all across the island, explained Minister Bartlett. In making the announcement Minister Bartlett underscored that the future success of the island's tourism sector hinges on workers being vaccinated in order to stem the spread of the deadly COVID-19 virus. Among the persons to be targeted are workers in hotels, villas and guest houses, attractions, airports, cruise ports, craft markets as well as ground transportation operators. This task force has a very important job of getting our 170,000 tourism workers vaccinated. This is vital to the full recovery of the tourism sector and by extension the wider economy, because our tourism workers are on the front line and if they are not fully vaccinated then our sector will not be able to recover in a safe and sustainable way, he expressed. The minister was quick to note that tourism workers will not be mandated to be vaccinated. However, he again urged them to get vaccinated. The vaccines are very effective in preventing hospitalization and death. So, I encourage all our tourism workers to capitalize on the opportunity to be vaccinated in order to safeguard your lives, your relatives as well as your communities, Minister Bartlett expressed. Mr. Bartlett emphasized that the task force will take a collaborative approach, which has proven to be very effective in managing the pandemic since March 2020, when the first COVID-19 cases were confirmed in Jamaica. I am confident that this united approach will be effective because it has been fundamental to our success in introducing our COVID-19 health and safety protocols, our innovative COVID-resilient corridors and the framework to facilitate the testing of visitors to the island. We will continue to work hand-in-hand -hand with our tourism partners to guarantee the recovery of our all-important tourism sector, he added. Hash Rebuilding Travel